Presenting the transcription feature, Superman. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Yes, it's Superman, strange visitor from the planet Krypton, who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can leap tall buildings at a single bound, race a speeding bullet to its target, then steal in his bare hand, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth and justice. But before we join Superman, listen. And now to our story. Having returned from a perilous adventure with the lost nation of the Inca Indians, Clark Kent, in reality Superman, has again been enlisted by the government to aid in the all-out battle for freedom. But this time, Kent's assignment is cloaked in secrecy. Only one man knows of his appointment as a special agent in the espionage division of the Secret Service. And that man is Terry White, editor of the Daily Planet. There are sinister forces at work, forces seeking to undermine and destroy the industries vital to the defense of our nation. Like venomous snakes, they strike in the shadowed darkness. A boat sinks at its dock. An explosion wrecks the munitions plant. A deadly fire levels an entire shipyard. And the paid enemies of freedom have struck from within. To wipe them out is Clark Kent's job, but even he has no idea of what is in store for him. Even he is unaware that for once, the amazing powers of Superman are going to be put to a test. Our story begins behind the gray stone walls of the state prison. In a corner of the electrical shop, two men are bent over an electric motor, pretending to repair it. The older of the two is a man Clark Kent exposed and sent to jail, the international criminal known throughout the world as the Yellow Mask. Momentarily, his steel-gray eyes shift to the armed prison guard standing at the door. Motioning his companion closer... The yellow mask speaks. Two minutes to go. Are you sure everything's ready? Yeah. Where's the gun? In my shirt. Let me have it. Be careful. Keep your back to the guard. Here it is. Okay. The, the, the guard's coming over. Do something, you fool. Pick up the screwdriver. Well, how about it, you guys? Ain't that motor fixed yet? It will be in a couple of minutes. All right. Stop gabbing now and finish it. We will in a couple of minutes. I sure thought he had the finger on it. I'll do all the thinking. You just follow orders. Why did you have to keep repeating about the couple of minutes? I got the shakes listening to you. I always tell the truth. Everything will be finished in a couple of minutes, including the guard. Keep working that screwdriver. Okay. And if he comes again, try not to shake. You're a cool one. You got ice water for blood. No, I've got brains. I knew once this war started, they'd look for me. Hell is no fool. Is that the guy got the gun through? Hella? Yeah. Hardly. He wouldn't risk his precious neck. Not Hella. He's too smart. Who is this guy, Hella? You'll find out, I hope. Now, that's enough talk. That he sent us to go. You remember what you to do? Yeah. Yeah, you start the motor. And I yell like I caught my hand in the flywheel. Make it look good. We've got to get the guard over so I can let him have it. I thought you said no shooting. There won't be unless I can't help it. Now get the gun butt. Ten seconds. Get ready. Okay. Five seconds. Make it good. Yeah, yeah, I will. All right, here it goes. I'm turning it on. <laughs> Hey, hey, what's going on here? He's heard. He, he caught his hand on the flywheel. Oh, yeah? Yes, and so will you be. <laughs> quiet! Quiet, everyone! Keep those machines running and block the door. I'm making a break. How about it? Yeah, oh, quiet! I'm sorry, but it wasn't planned that way. Get that acetylene torch, Rusty. Okay. Work on the window bar, sorry. Why can't we break with you? Yeah, yeah, I, I said I'm sorry. I'm sorry. None of us would stand a chance. Stand back. Don't make a sound. Open up in there. How's it coming, Rusty? Okay. Only three more. Open up or we'll drill the lock. Get down, all of you that may be shooting. She's wide open. All the bars are burned through. Good. That's your last chance. We've got machine guns. We're going to let you have it unless you open up. All right, Rusty. Step back from the window. What do you mean? I'm going with you. Sorry, Rusty. I'm not carrying baggage. Hey, wait a minute. You heard what I said. 
Step back from the window. Can't be alarm bell. I'll have to be going. So long, Rusty. You dirty low down sneak and not yet! Tri-State Alarm, Order 33B. Check all roads, terminals, and stations for man known as Yellow Mask. Escaped from state prison, 4.22 p.m., age 48, height 5 feet 7 inches, weight 150 pounds, iron gray hair, gray eyes, small scar on upper lip, armed with revolver, dangerous. I will repeat, official, Tri-State Alarm, Order 33B. Check all roads, terminals. This is Don Carey bringing you the latest up to the minute news. As darkness falls over the eastern seaboard, the greatest manhunt in the history of the police department is taking place. Three hours ago, the international criminal known throughout the world as the Yellow Mask made a daring escape from the state prison. Thus far, his whereabouts are unknown. But the police of five states have laid a giant dragnet and expect to announce his recapture shortly. Hexer, Hexy, what Hexy? Yellow Mask escape police. Hexy, Hexy, let me here. Yellow Mask escape. Oh, come in, Kent. Close the door. Any news? How the thing, Mr. White? Seems to have vanished in the thin air. I just spoke to the warden. The car that was waiting for him outside the prison carried phony license plates. Mm, you'd imagine we didn't have enough to worry about. And now this has to happen. The yellow mask floating around loose. Yeah. You remember how he almost blew up the Daily Planet building? How could I forget? Yeah, he's a smart potato, Kent. Smart and ruthless. When they send him up, he swore he'd get you someday. I know. Well, maybe I'd better call the commissioner and arrange for a police escort until they nab him. No, that's not necessary, Mr. White. I can take care of myself. And anyway, if he does get through the dragnet, he'll have to lay low for a long time. Mm, there's no telling with that bird. He's bad business. Do they know how he got the gun? Oh, yes, I forgot that. It was smuggled into one of the other prisoners, a life termer named Rusty Wallace. The mask was supposed to take Wallace with him, but at the last moment he changed his mind. Wallace claims a man named Heller sent the gun. Heller? Who, yeah. Who's Heller? Well, the police aren't sure yet. They're checking. There's a Max Heller listed in the FBI files as a foreign agent. Hmm. He was deported two years ago for alien activities, and there's no record of his having returned to the country. Hmm. Foreign agent, eh? Well, if it's the same Heller. I wouldn't be a bit surprised, Kent. Espionage should be right up the yellow mask tally. Can you imagine what damage a man like that could do with his twisted mind? Well, I wouldn't worry too much, Mr. White. The police will get him. Maybe tough if he has outside help. Weeks can go by before they can catch up with him. And that's time enough to do a lot of damage. Right here in Metropolis alone, there are three munition plants, two airplane factories, and a dozen other vital defense industries. He's got to be tracked down, Kent. There's no telling where he'll strike first. I'll take it. Very White speaking. Huh? Oh, just a minute. For you, Ken. Oh. oh, thanks. Hello. Greetings, Mr. Kent. Uh, who is this? Don't you recognize my dulcet voice? Well, I'm sorry, I don't. That pity possibly has changed since you last heard it. Think hard, Mr. Kent. Who is this? Now don't lose your temper, Mr. Kent. It doesn't pay. You're a little dull tonight, aren't you? Now, look here. If you think Just I got... a minute, Mr. Kent. I'm going to tell you who I am. Steady. Your old friend, the yellow mask. No. Are you still with me, Mr. Kent? Or was the shot too much? I'm still with you. But where are you, mask? Wouldn't you like to know, Mr. Kent? You and the police. Well, you, uh... You hardly expect to get away with that prison break, Mass. That's asking a little too much. It's ten o'clock, Mr. Kent. I've gotten away with it for six hours. But that's not what I call for. I wanted you to know that I haven't forgotten. I owe a little debt to you and Miss Lane and Mr. White. I'm going to pay that debt. What do you want to 
the first things I do. No being traced, Mr. Wright. Are you listening, Mr. I'm listening. Good. In a few moments, the daily planet building will go dark. The lights will go out, the presses will stop, and something very interesting will happen. It's a little surprise I've been planning for you, Mr. Kent. A pleasant little surprise. I hope you like it. Goodbye. Yo. Oh. Did you trace it yet, Mr. White? No, not yet. Operator, operator, for the love of... Huh? Oh, yeah. Yes, okay. Thanks. He called from Metropolis 4800. We better notify the police. They can check the number and... Wait a minute, wait a minute. What was that number? Metropolis 4800. Are you sure, Mr. White? What do you mean, am I sure? Do you think I'm deaf? But Metropolis 4800 is our number, the number of the Daily Planet. What? Great Scott. Kent, what does that mean? means he called from somewhere in this building. No, no, Kent. That couldn't be. It couldn't I'll be. Take it easy, Mr. White. I'm afraid that's what it is. He's somewhere in the Daily Planet building. What? And we've got him trapped. I'll have every door locked. Call the police. Kent, we... Hey. Hey, what's happened to the lights? Kent, who turned the lights out? to clear this shaft so I can get down to the basement where that main switch was thrown. And that's to lift the car above this floor. Here goes. Oh, these elevator cars must weigh ten tons. Coming slowly but surely. Somebody's going to be surprised when they see all this steel cable twisted up on the floor. Just a few feet more to go. There. That does it. Now I can crawl under the car. First, I better tie this cable to something so she doesn't drop. No, wait, I won't have to. The safety lock's holding it. That saves time. Now to crawl under. And down. There. Now there must be a door leading out of the bottom of this shaft. Yes, here it is. I haven't time to force the lock. I'll have to break through it. Now, let's see where we are. I don't know my way around this basement as well as I should. Wait. Strange odor down here. Great Scott, it's gas. Now I know what the mask meant when he said he had a surprise for us. He opened the valve on the gas main. If someone comes down here and strikes a match, this whole building will blow up. Got to find that valve somehow. <coughs> it's getting stronger. It must be somewhere near the gas main. Good thing my lungs can take this stuff. What's that? Someone's trapped down here, suffocating. Where are you? Speak up. I'm coming. All right, I'll get you out of this. There we are. In just a minute, we'll get some fresh air into your lungs. Now, let's see. That door should lead to an alley. Ah, it does. There. There we are. That's better, isn't it? That's it. Breathe deeply. You're the night watchman, aren't you? Someone struck me behind when I when I came to that guy. Now, just take it easy. Take it easy. Sit here for a while. I'm going back to find the open valve. Two men burn his room. What? Get him out. Gas reaches the off. Burn is it? Got to turn it off first. Where is the gas main? Can't miss it. The red pipe overhead. Red pipe? Follow it. You see a valve. All right. What's that? Explosion. Burn his room. You stay here. I'll be back. He said there were two men in the furnace room. The boilers blew up. I'm afraid I'm too late. Oh, I can see flames. Burning oil. Oh, room's an inferno. Those flames spread. This building is doomed. I've got to get those men out first. Ah, there they are. On the floor. Their clothes are on fire. Here goes. Oh, heat is terrific. Even I can feel it. There. I've got them. Now to get out through that wall of fire. Ah, they're badly burned, but still alive. I'll take them out to the watchman. He can call an ambulance while I look for that valve. There. Oh, got them out, eh? Are uh, they dead? No, but they need medical attention. Get an ambulance or a doctor right away. I've got to shut off that gas. Hey, don't go in there again. I'll blow up the minute. I'll be all right. Hey, Mister, you're crazy. You can blow up sky. Hey, Mister. Red pipe overhead. See now. Yes, there it is. Now he said to follow it. Follow it. Uh, this valve must be near the furnace room. Another gas pocket went up. Wait. I hear hissing. That must be the valve. It is. Oh, <coughs> gas is pouring out. Must turn this way to the right. Yes. That does it. There, it's off. Now to try and put out that blaze in the furnace room. Uh-oh. Sounds like fire engines. They'll be able to take care of this with a few small extinguishers. Now I've got to find Perry White. Perry White. Perry White. 
As Kent returns to the editorial offices of the Daily Planet, a strange scene is taking place in the sumptuous penthouse of a fashionable apartment building overlooking the city. The yellow mask, no longer garbed in drab prison clothes, stands at a window peering through high-powered night binoculars trained on the illuminated clock of the Daily Planet Tower. Behind him, seated in a chair, is a middle-aged man with close-cropped sandy-colored hair, thin lips, and greenish eyes with pupils like shoe buttons. He frowns impatiently, flicks the ashes of his cigarette into a silver tray, and then speaks. You're wasting your time staring out of that window, mine hair. Why do you bother with such inconsequential things? Have you never heard of revenge, Heller? I should like you to remember that I risked everything to affect your release from prison. It was not done so you could waste your time and energies with unimportant people. You agreed to devote all your efforts to the cause. Is that not true? For some reason or other, my pretty little scheme to blow the planet building sky high in this fire. It's still there. Well, some other time. Now, what were you saying, Helen? Simply that I will require your undivided attention. I did not risk everything so that you might revenge yourself on a stupid newspaper man. He's far from stupid. You don't know Kent. What was that name? Kent. Clark Kent. The name has a familiar ring. Wait. Strauss. Yeah. Bring to me the latest file of American operatives. Yeah, I'll find them. You haven't missed a trick, have you? Communicating phones, filing systems, every modern convenience. We cannot afford, as you say, to miss a trick. There's too much at stake. Uh, thank you, Strauss. Now let us see. Here's a list of newly appointed Secret Service operatives. How did you get it? The obvious and means to get everything. All that it requires is time, money, and brains. The course possesses all three. Here, let me read this list of names. Anderson, Adams, Black, Darrow, Frost, Houston, Long, McGuire. No, the name Kent is not here. Well, what makes you think he has anything to do with the Secret Service? He's a newspaper reporter. I seem to remember it. And my memory never fails me. Oh, wait, here's a special notation. I knew I was right. Listen. Appointed as operative at large under sealed orders, Clark Kent. When was the appointment made? Let me see. Here it is. Four days ago. He has not long been on the job. We'd better watch him, Heller. He's dangerous. Don't worry. They are all watched. They're all dangerous. But now let us discuss business. You know, of course, why we require your services. Yes. You think I'm valuable. That... And more. We are aware of the existence in this country of an amazing invention. A steel Frankenstein. A robot made of metal known as the Mechanical Man. This is all news to me. You seem to forget I've been behind bars for two years. No matter. This Mechanical Man exists. We have seen it. We have offered a fabulous sum. Not only for the model, but for the design. Our offers have been refused. We must have the steel monster and many like him. Why? I shall tell you why. Because it is our job to instill fear. Out of fear will come panic. And out of panic will come weakness. That is the formula of our success. This mechanical man. How does it work? Almost with human instinct. Controlled by special radio, it can fly like an airship. Walk upright like a man. And spread destructions on all sides. Yeah. Just ten feet tall. A giant fashion of steel plates on the maze of wires. Picture it, my hair. You press a button, turn a switch, and this steel giant hurtles through the air in any direction you may choose. A shipyard, perhaps. There the incendiary bombs he carries in his massive hands will consume everything in flames. A munitions factory, you say? Ah. One stick of dynamite, and it is enough. But there is something else. The fear of which I spoke. Yes. Imagine, if you can, this towering monster lo- to the street of the city. Children will scream. Women will faint, and strong men will seek shelter. Where is this mechanical man? 
Why hasn't this government taken it over? Why? Because they're fools. The use of this monster they regard as, as inhuman. It is not honorable. In war, there is no honor. Ah, but we will take advantage of this stupidity. You will go to the man who has created this steel weapon as a representative of the American government. You will have all the credentials. When do I start? In the morning. It's midnight. The best attire. There's important work to be done tomorrow. We cannot fail. Hi. And now to our story. With the help of Max Heller, a foreign agent, the Yellow Mask international criminal escaped from the state prison, seeking revenge from Clark Kent because Kent and the Daily Planet were responsible for putting him behind bars. The mask opened a gas main valve in the basement of the newspaper building and almost succeeded in blowing up the 30-story skyscraper. But Kent, as Superman, stopped the flow of deadly gas before the damage was too great. Meanwhile, the mask is hiding out in the penthouse apartment of the espionage ring led by Heller. There, the foreign agent tells him what is wanted of him. An American has perfected an amazing mechanical man, a huge, giant-like creature of steel and wires, radio controls, and capable of everything but thought. Heller wants this metal monster no matter what the cost. To spread fear and panic and destruction. The mass, posing as a government representative, is to get it for him. Unmindful that the police of five states are looking for him with orders to bring him in dead or alive, the mass, armed with forged credentials, has gained access to the huge barn-like laboratory of Wallace Thornton, inventor of the mechanical man. At one end of the high ceiling room, the metal monster stands upright. The steel plates of its mammoth body gleaming of the strong lights. Its arms dangling like those of a giant gorilla. Its head is a square steel box with glowing red lamps for eyes. Suddenly, as Thornton twists the dial on the control board, the steel body shudders and the mechanical man walks forward slowly. It's amazing, Mr. Thornton, simply amazing. I'm sorry, I can't fully demonstrate its abilities. The War Department has asked me not to remove it from this room. I understand it's capable of radio control flight. Yes, the steel plates along the sides of the body open to form wings. A collapsed propeller is hidden in the top of its head. That's its one drawback, its vulnerability. Oh, what do you mean? If, for any reason, the propeller is damaged while the robot is in flight, it will crash to earth out of control. I'd be inclined to regard that as a very minor drawback, Mr. Thornton. Planes are no different. Quite true. Now, as I mentioned before, the government has reconsidered its original stand in the matter of taking over your mechanical man. Price, of course, is not a factor. It was never a matter of price. I want no money. If the mechanical man can in any way aid our war effort, I shall feel amply repaid. I can take the blueprints with me now. Arrangements can be made to pick up the working model this afternoon. I shall have to communicate with Major Nichols at the War Department before releasing anything to you. Oh, that isn't at all necessary, Mr. Thornton. I represent the government. You've seen my credentials. Yes, but I should like Major Nichols' assurance that... That what? Well, that everything is official. I can't afford to take that chance. Oh, you would be taking any chances. Certainly my credentials should be sufficient proof. Now, come, Mr. Thornton, don't be over-cautious. The War Department is anxious to begin work on duplicates of your model. I must bring the blueprints back with me. Would there be any harm if I called Major Nichols? There isn't time. I'm due in Washington at 3 o'clock. I must leave immediately. May I have the blueprints? I should like to try and contact Major Nichols first. I'm sorry to have to do this, but... We're at war, and extreme caution is essential. I I'll call him from this phone. It won't take but a moment. Excuse me. Long distance, please. Calling Washington, D.C. Put that phone down, Mr. Thornton. Hang up. Why, uh, never mind the call operator. That's better. Now back away from the desk. Why are you pointing a gun at me? Well, don't ask foolish questions, and you get no foolish answers. Where are the blueprints? You hardly expect me to tell you, now that you've revealed your true colors. Not only do I expect you to tell me, but I want the information fast. Your suspicions were justified. The government isn't interested in your mechanical man, but my people are. Who are your people? Never mind. 
Open that safe. I'm not accustomed to taking orders at the point of a gun. I don't react very well to them. Now listen, Thornton. I'm a desperate man. I escaped from prison less than 24 hours ago. The police are looking for me now. They'll have to kill me to get me. You understand? Perfectly. Then open the safe. No. I'm warning you, Thornton. I've killed in cold blood before, and I can do it again. Maybe it might help if I told you who I am. They call me the Yellow Mask. The yellow is in the wrong place. Actually, it's running up and down your back. Why, you hope? No. No, I need you for the time being, but I'll remember that. Now put your hands behind your back. Turn around. This piece of wire will make a nice bracelet for your wrist. There. Not too tight, I hope. You're wasting your time. I'll worry about that. Just keep your mouth shut. It's been a long time since I opened the safe, but this one doesn't look too tough. The blueprints aren't in the safe. We'll see. Now, don't try anything, Thornton. I'll let you have it. The keeps. Now, let's listen to these tumblers. Not too bad. Watch me, Thornton. Maybe you can learn something. You think I'd be fool enough to leave those blueprints in that antiquated safe? Shut up. There. That's number one. Not that, eh? I haven't lost the magic touch. There's nothing in the safe but some old insurance policies. Fine, I like old insurance policies. And keep quiet. Number two. One more should open it. You're getting nervous, don't you? Nervous? <laughs> why should I be nervous? I'll show you why in a moment. Just watch. Unless I miss my guess, that opens it. Now, let's see. It does. What were you saying about insurance policies, Thornton? This looks like a roll of blueprints. They seem to be marked, too. Plans and design for radio control robot. Just what I was looking for. Coincidence, isn't it? All right. You win. Now, would you untie my wrist, please? The wire is cutting into my skin. I think not. You're better off that way. But you have the plans. What more do you want? Certainly, I can do you no harm. Not while your finger is on the trigger of that gun. You seem to forget I have to make a safe getaway or else these blueprints have no value. That telephone is much too handy. In fact, I'll trust you up properly before I leave. Another piece of wire for your ankles and a gag for your mouth. Where are you going? Keep away from that control board, Thornton. It's too late now. The mechanical man can't be stopped. No. No. Stop him. Not a chance. He'll walk right through that wall. Stop him. Stop that monster. Stop it. <laughs> you asked for this. Oh. I must die with him, There must be one of these. Well, that doesn't do it. Neither does this. Maybe these switches. No. No, he's still coming. i better get out of here before it's too late. There's no stopping him. Crashing through the wooden side of the building, the mechanical man, driven by the radio impulse from the control panel, marches on like a giant specter, its blood-red eyes flashing, its long, jointed arms swinging at its sides. Crossing the yard, it flattens an iron fence as though it were cardboard and heads for the highway. A passing motorist, seeing the steel monster bearing down on him, turns white and jams the gas pedal to the floor. Across the road, a woman sweeping her front porch looks up, screams, and drops in a dead faint. And still, the huge, towering creature from another world plods on, senseless, brainless, but alive, mowing down everything in its path, sending terrified children flying into their homes, draining the color from men's faces. Like wildfire, the news travels, telephones jangle, hoarse voices repeat the warning over and over again. Mechanical man! In the office of Perry White, editor of the Daily Planet, Clark Kent and Lois Lane stand by as their volcanic chief barks into a telephone. Oh, for the love of heaven, Leeds, talk sense. What do you mean, mechanical man? Yes, yes, I know. He's ten feet tall with red eyes and... What? 
Do I think you're crazy? I'm sure of it. Now listen to me. This isn't April Fool's Day. And even if it was, I don't like that kind of humor. If you can't turn in legitimate stories, get yourself a job digging ditches. And another thing. Now hold on a minute. Oh, uh, Kent, hmm? what did that boy bring in? A teletype flash. Listen. Giant mechanical man terrifying residents of Linwood, metropolis suburb. What? But then it's true. Is that all it says? Yes, it's just a flash. Oh, uh, Leeds, we just got a teletype flash here. Uh, well, uh, maybe you're right. Uh, what about? Why, the mechanical man, you idiot. Now listen to me. Where was it last seen? Where? On the turnpike heading for the orphanage farm. All right. And sending Kent out there. Watch for him. That's all. Uh, get out there as fast as you can, Kent. Yeah. Linwood Turnpike, somewhere near the orphanage farm. Okay. I'm going with you. Oh, no, Lois. I said I'm going with you. But it may be dangerous. From what Leeds said, it is dangerous. I don't care, Kent. I'm going along. Oh, stop arguing. Stop arguing. Let her go, Kent. Chances are it's just a lot of nonsense. Mechanical man. Oh, it's insane. It's mad. Things like that don't happen. All right, Lois, come on. Oh, Kent. In case there is something to it. There's anything to this mechanical man business, Clark? Anything more than a joke or an optical illusion? That's hard to say, Lois. Leeds is generally pretty reliable. He said he'd seen it. I get cold shivers thinking about it. Just imagine an army of mechanical men, solid lines of steel, a million human tanks that nothing could stop. Woo! Gasping. Yeah. I wonder whether we're on the right road. I haven't seen any signposts for miles. Why don't you stop at that gas station up ahead? There must be somebody there who can tell us. That's a good idea. Well, I guess I was wrong. Nobody here. Yes, there is. A man's coming out of the house. Yeah. What's he carrying that shotgun for? No. Look, there's a revolver strapped around his waist. It's allowed. I beg your pardon, but is this the road to Linwood? Yeah, it's the road to Linwood, all right, but you'd better not take it. Why, is it torn up? Construction? No, no, there's a monster loose up that way. A monster? That's right, lady. I come by here 20 minutes ago. That's why I'm toting all these firearms, just in case he decides to come back. Did you see him? No, my boy did, though. He's a giant. He's wearing some kind of shiny armor. My boy said he was twice the size of an ordinary man. Yeah, I know it's hard to take, lady, but it's true. They're talking about it now on the radio. Special bulletins and warnings. Well, thanks a lot. You ain't going to Linwood, are you? I'm afraid we have to. So long. You're crazy if you do. Forcing the car to the limit of its speed, Kent races toward Linwood, convinced now that the mechanical man is more than just a myth. Meanwhile, two highway patrolmen, armed with rifles, are parked on the side road behind a screen of huge bushes waiting for the great steel monster to come within range. Off in the distance, they can see its box-like head, its ruby eyes blinking like ghostly danger signals. They crouch low behind their patrol car. Get set, Joe. Here it comes. Oh, okay. Aim for its head, for them blinking eyes. We gotta stop it. Keep low. Well, how about it? No, no, not yet. Let it get close. I can't take no chance of the missing. When you start choking, don't stop. Empty the magazine. All right, now. I'll count three. One. Two. Three. Shoot! It ain't stopping. My gun's empty. Run, Joe! Run! With a steel-jacketed bullet flattened against it like so much putty, the mechanical man plods on unharmed, save for the shattering of one of the red bulbs in its head. Now more horrible than ever, with only a single blood-red eye blinking like that of a monster cyclops, the huge man-made creature starts up the hill in the direction of the orphanage, only a mile away. There, in the administrative office, the superintendent, drawn and anxious, stands at the window while the matron, nervous and pale, paces the floor. You'll wear that rug out, Miss Perkins. This is hardly the time for levity, Mr. Danforth. I'm beside myself. I don't know which way to turn. Well, why not try relaxing? You ask me to relax with a, with a bloodthirsty monster about to descend on us. Well, that's a slight exaggeration. So far, there have been no reports about this so-called monster's bloodthirstiness. But you do admit there is a monster. I admit to nothing yet. 
Oh, why haven't the police arrived? Well, they'll be here. Yes, after we're torn limb from limb. But it's too late. Mr. Danforth, I don't like to have to say this, but I feel you're taking your responsibility too lightly. The lives of a thousand children are in your hands. Thank you for bringing that to my attention, Miss Perkins. Sarcasm doesn't alter the situation. <laughs> what are you going to do? Just what I've been doing. Wait. If you prefer to leave the grounds, you're privileged to do so. But don't come back. <laughs> I must say you're acting in a very high-handed manner. I would never have suspected it of you. Your suspicions don't interest me at the moment. Well, what time is it? <laughs> Ten minutes to one. We've delayed the lunch hour long enough. I'm not going to starve those children because of some mythical monster. Will you please ring the lunch bell, Miss Perkins? Are you mad? Please ring the lunch bell. Do you know what you're doing? Bringing a thousand children together in one building so that monster can get to them all at once. It's murder. That's what it is. Mass murder. All right, Miss Perkins. I'll ring the lunch bell. <laughs> What do you think those shots were that we heard a while back? No, it's hard to tell. Maybe deer hunters or someone sniping at the mechanical man. Yeah. You should be getting to the orphanage farm any minute now. Keep your eyes open. I am, but I don't know what to look for. Unfortunately, I don't number any mechanical men among my acquaintances. Still don't believe it exists, do you? Even after that story the gas station man told us. I can't make myself believe it. That's the trouble. It's too fantastic. It's incredible. Yeah. Like a nightmare full of strange shapes. Just as Mr. White said, things don't happen that way. Yeah, that's probably what your grandfather would have said, too, if he'd seen an airplane 50 years ago. I suppose you're right. Look, look, Clark, isn't that the entrance to the orphanage just up ahead there? Well, looks like it. Well, either we beat the mechanical man or he's already been here. Or he's non-existent. Like those men from Mars that caused a panic a few years ago, remember? Uh-huh. I have a funny feeling this is slightly different. Well, maybe you're right. That brick building looks like the office. Yes, I'll pull up. Like we're being welcomed by a committee of one. Yeah. Or is that hawk nosed female running toward us, the monster? Oh, are you the police? Are you the police? Uh, no, madam. We're newspaper reporters. Oh. Uh -huh. Are you by any chance the orphan superintendent? No, I'm the matron. Oh. Mr. Danforth is in his office. I'll take you to him. This way, please. Thank you. Come on, Lois. <clears throat> Some newspaper reporters to see you, Mr. Danforth. I can't see any reporters now. Well, we're not here in a repertorial capacity, Mr. Danforth. This is Miss Lane, and my name is Kent. Oh, oh, how do you do? How do you do? I'm sorry, but we're all under a strain at the moment. <laughs> That's putting it mildly. Miss Perkins, our matron, is under a particular strain. Yes, it's uh, quite evident. Well, I'd like to know what normal individual wouldn't be with a monster about to descend on you. I take it the mechanical man has not yet arrived. No, have you heard anything about it? Nothing except that one of our local reporters phoned to tell us it was moving in the direction of the orphanage. Has anyone seen this, uh, this Frankenstein, Mr. Kent? From what we can learn, a number of people have had that rare privilege. <laughs> Seems that nobody waits long enough to get a close-up view. That's what makes the reports vary. Some say it's a giant in a coat of mail, others that it's a metal monster breathing fire and brimstone. Personally, I think it's all imagination. Mm. That's very interesting, but hardly authentic. Your thoughts on the matter. Miss Perkins, perhaps you'd better go to the dining room while the children are having lunch. I prefer staying here, if you don't mind, Mr. Danforth. Then keep quiet. What? Well, I... Well, very idea. Never in all my life. I but... said keep quiet. Or leave. All right. I will leave. I'll go to my children. I'll die with them if necessary. Farewell. <clears throat> Terribly sorry, Mr. Danforth. I assume we were responsible for that emotional outburst. No, not at all, Miss Lane. Miss Perkins has gone to pieces. Why on earth she should be afraid of any monster, though, is beyond me. <laughs> Maybe it's no joking matter. Perhaps it's more serious than we're willing to admit. You say there have been some eyewitness reports, Mr. Kent? Not a few, but no two agree. Boiled down, the creature seems to be a metal robot, a mechanical man. How he happens to have motion and who is controlling that motion is a mystery. Well, if he's coming, you'd better hurry. I'm getting a little annoyed. I'll try the police again. I called them 20 minutes ago, and they promised to send some men over. Operator, uh, let me have the police station at Linwood, please. This is Mr. Danton at the orphanage farm. I beg your pardon? Oh, I see. Thank you. All right, the line must be busy. Everyone clamoring for police protection. No, the operator says there's no one at the station. The entire force is out. Probably monster hunting like we are. 
It may become the new national game, you know. You could call... What is it, Lois? Look, coming over the crest of that hill. The monster. Great Scott. Can't believe my eyes. Are we seeing things? No, it's a mechanical man. They were right. He's heading right for that dining room. There are a thousand children in there. Clark, where are you going? Head him off. Well, don't be a fool. You can't do it alone. I think I can't let go of my arm, Lois. There isn't much time. You'll be taking an awful chance, Mr. Kent. Lois, please. I'm not going to let you go. Sorry, but I can't. Clark, I had to come. Lois, go back quickly. No, I'm going to stick with you. If anything happens, it'll happen to both of us. Lois, don't be a fool. Go back. No. With only a scant 50 feet separating him from the mechanical monster, Kent realizes he can do only one thing. Smash the steel giant as Superman, even though Lois will be an eyewitness to it all. But at the very moment he reaches a decision, something is happening in the barn-like laboratory from which the mechanical man first emerged. Wallace Thornton, its creator, struck down by the yellow mask, has regained consciousness. Staggering to the control panel, he throws a switch, turns another dial. A jagged blue spark jumps the gap between two metal rods. And miles away, the mechanical man stops short. Clark, he stopped dead in his tracks. Yes. Look, his arms are coming up. No, those aren't his arms. The steel plates on both sides of his body are spreading out like wings. Look. Look, the top of his head is opening. What's going to happen? Almost anything can happen. It's uncanny. What's that? hum of an electric motor. Somewhere inside that steel body. Great Scott, Lois. A propeller is coming out of his head. It's spinning. Clark, he's going to fly. Get back, Lois. There he goes. Dreaming. It can't be possible. Get to a phone, Lois, in a hurry. Call the office and give them the story. I'm going to chase that mechanical man in the car. He can't fly fast. I'll come back for you. Get the story in. No, Clark, wait. I'll go with you. Clark, Clark. This is far enough away from the orphanage. They can't see me. Now, to get that mechanical monstrosity as Superman before it causes any more damage. Up! Up! And away! Leaping high into the air, Superman wings across the heavens. His amazing vision able to pierce the low-hanging clouds and mark the strange flight of the steel robot. Higher and still higher, until he is above it and can hear its motor purring in the feet of its small propeller. For a brief moment, Superman studies the curious metal monster, now become a trim airship. Studies it as the brilliant rays of the sun shine on its steel plates. And then, streaming ahead of it, he suddenly wheels in flight and with the speed of a bullet plunges toward the whirling propeller. One blow of his granite-like fist and the metal blades of the propeller crumple like tinfoil. The monster falters in midair, hangs motionless for a moment, and then, almost like a thing alive struck down in flight, it plummets to the ground thousands of feet below with Superman diving after it. Down, down, down to end in a thunderous crash. And hours later, in the penthouse hideout of Max Heller, leader of a foreign espionage ring, the yellow mask, notorious international criminal, chuckles as he scans the front page of the Daily Planet Evening Edition. (laughs) Listen to this, Heller. That Lane girl I was telling you about wrote the story. It's rich. Although reluctant to release any information, the police inferred that the only existing set of blueprints and plans detailing the construction of Wallace Thornton's mechanical man were believed to be missing from the latter's safe. As plain cagey, believed to be missing. They know they're missing because we've got them. Haven't we, Heller? Does it say anything else? Just this. The twisted remains of Thornton's working model of the almost human robot, found in a cornfield where it crashed, are now being examined by a board of mechanical experts. However, little hope is held out that the model can be reconstructed. So badly was it damaged. All in all, Heller, I should say I did a pretty thorough job. You have the only existing blueprints. And the one model is a total wreck. What is that to stop you? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We will begin at once to build up the fear and panic already started by the mechanical man's unrehearsed exhibition. I have trained men working on the blueprints. Within a week... There will be ready another mechanical man. You didn't waste much time, did you? Time, mine here, is money and the lives of my people. It cannot be wasted. Our first objective will be the shipyard. But before even we do that, there are steps to be taken. Important steps in the breakdown of morale. We must make that name, the mechanical man, 
feared throughout the country. We must drive people behind locked doors, make them cower and cringe with nerves at the breaking point. We must instill fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of the horrible, fear of life itself. And this is how we shall do it. Now listen closely. Every move is important. We are playing a game of chess with human lives as pawns. Nothing must go wrong. Yes, Mr. Wyatt? What about that follow-up story in the Mechanical Man story? How long do you think we can hold the presses? Okay, I'll be right in with it. Work, work, work. Now rest for the weary. Now let's see, where was I? Oh, yes. One line to go. The police are expecting to announce an arrest shortly. There, that does it. Follow-up is no work of art, but it'll have to do. According to the information from Washington... Oh, I didn't know you were here, Clark. Well, have you recovered from your experience with that animated sardine can, the mechanical what? Uh, don't joke about it, Lois. It's a serious matter. You're telling me. I had that metal man now from towering over me for a few harrowing seconds. I know how serious it is. Here's the follow-up. Mr. Kent gets quite a plug. That isn't necessary, Lois. All right, all right. I'll read it and send it down. Uh, you can call it a day. Thanks, Chief. Well? Well, what? Uh, Kent and I have something to discuss, Lois. Uh, would you mind... Oh, uh... sorry. Night. Night, Lois. Honey, what could they be discussing that I can't hear? As I was saying, Mr. White, the information from Washington is fairly complete. I hate to eavesdrop, but I think I have a right to know what's going on. What is it? Of course, you understand this is all confidential. Oh, naturally, naturally. Well, Wallace Thornton, the inventor of the mechanical man, has definitely identified the yellow mask as the man who stole the only existing set of blueprints. That, that again? Yes, and it's also been established that Max Keller, the farm agent, is in this country. In fact, they believe he maintains headquarters in the penthouse of the Montgomery Apartments right here in Metropolis. Max Keller, Montgomery Apartments. Well, what's the connection between Heller and the yellow mask? Well, it was Heller who engineered the mask prison break. Evidently, they've joined hands in espionage. Putting the pieces together, it looks as though they're planning to use replicas of Thornton's mechanical man to spread terror and destruction in this country. What a story, Kent. We'd scoop everyone with it. I know, but it can't be used. When I accepted that Secret Service assignment. I agreed to keep confidential information out of print. With your approval, if you recall. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, but it's still a terrific story when we can break it. Uh, what's the next move? I've been assigned to watch Heller. We don't want to arrest the mask until we can involve both of them. As it is, we have no evidence against Keller, save that he's an alien. This time, the espionage division wants to get him and get him right. Well, be careful, Kent. I don't want you to run any risks. Well, we're all running risks these days, Mr. White. Part of the battle. Yes, I suppose so. Well, keep me posted on the road. It's a little time to blow a scram. So, my friend Clark Kent is a special secret service, service operative, tracking down a foreign spy and trying to steal all the glory. Well, we'll fix that in short order. I'll show you how to land a spy, Clark, old boy. Not a Harry did it. Why can't Lois Lane? Max Heller, penthouse, Montgomery Apartments. On your way, lady. Drop me off at the Montgomery Apartments, Tony, and then swing around the corner and wait there for me. I'll be about an hour. And don't keep your meter running. Okay, Miss Lane. And remember this, Tony. I'm going up to the penthouse apartment. Oh, a little cocktail party, maybe, huh, Miss Lane? It'll be a party, but I don't think they'll serve cocktails. You won't forget, will you? The penthouse. Don't worry. I got a memory like a giraffe. You mean an elephant. Let it go. That's the Montgomery on the right, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, see you in an hour, Tony. All right. Up floor, please. Penthouse. Yes? There's a woman in the foyer. She wishes to see you. She gives the name? Yeah, Gerta Stein. Identification? No. The signal? No. I will look at her. There's a woman waiting to see me. One of your agents? Evidently not. She gives no identification and no signal. She says her name is Gerta Stein. I will look her over. And expose yourself to her? That is not necessary. Watch closely. I press this button, hidden behind the drapery, and a small panel in the wall opens. Now, look through the opening. 
tell me what you see. A girl standing in the foyer. Well, how's it done? This room is nowhere near the foyer. An ingenious arrangement of mirrors. Is our visitor attractive? I I can't tell. Her back is turned. Here, yeah, let me look. Ah, she's facing us now. Very attractive, I would say. A little nervous and ill at ease. One thing's always certain. Her name is not Goethe Stein. Here, yeah, what do you think? Look at her. Well? I... I've seen that girl before, Hella. Really? How interesting. Who is she? I... I can't place her looking at her this way. The image is too small. Shall we invite her in? Wait. I'd like to remain undercover for a while. Some place where I can observe her without her seeing me. That is easily arranged. They simply press another hidden button, and a large panel in the opposite wall will open. You will notice, once you have stepped inside, and I have closed the panel, that the eyes and the picture hung on the panel have been painted on thin gauze. You will be able to see through them. That's perfect. I shall ask the young lady in. Strauss. Yeah, Helen. I will see Miss Goethe Stein. Now, to close the viewing device... You may step into the wall aperture. Uh, keep your hands back as the panel slides shut. You ready? Yes. You do not have to worry about suffocation. The aperture is air-conditioned. I was wondering about that. Now, quiet. Now, this is coming. Miss Goethe Stein. Now, oh, come in, Miss Stein. Thank you, Herr Heller. That will be all, Strauss. Won't you sit down, Miss Stein? Uh, thank you. You must forgive me for my nervousness, but uh, they have been following me. It was difficult escaping them. Really? Oh, yes. It was the same in London. Oh, you worked in London. Since the beginning of the war. I see. Well, then, of course, you must know Karl Liebling. Oh, I know him well. It was uh, Herr Liebling who told me to report to you. Uh, you see, I'm considered quite valuable since I speak English quite fluently. Ah, and beautiful, if I may say so. Thank you. Well, I'm at your service, Herr Heller. There must be a great deal to be done here in America. Yes, a great deal. But uh, first, I should like you to meet my colleague, uh, provided he is ready. Uh, Are you mine, Herr? Yes, I'm ready. Who's speaking? Where did that voice come from? I will show you, Fräulein, by pressing this little button. Watch. Now, you two have met before, perhaps? Most assuredly, we have. Haven't we, Miss Lane? I have never seen this man before. And why does he call me by another name? Drop the phony accent. You're a reporter on the Daily Planet newspaper and your name is Lois Lane. The man is out of his mind. I don't think so. What do you mean? Without any corroboration, I would have mistrusted you. You failed to present either identification or the accepted signal. You told me you know Carl Liebling in London when no such man exists. But you take me for a fool. But I tell you... It doesn't matter what you tell us, Miss Lane. I knew we'd met before. I never forget a face. Certainly not a pretty face. You can keep your compliments to yourself. All right, I am Lois Lane. So what? Two can play at your game. Yes, but one always loses. And this time you have lost. It is unfortunate the stakes are so high. Very unfortunate. What exactly do you mean? I mean simply that you will have to suffer for your impudence. If you had no better sense than to attempt this stupid childish method of getting information, you will pay for that stupidity. As others before you have paid. This isn't the first time she's interfered with me, Hella. It will be the last. You can't threaten me. Goodbye. That door is locked, Miss Lane. So is that... Let me out of here. Uh, don't upset yourself. Let me out of here, I said. I heard you the first time. Now look here, you two. I'm an American citizen, and this isn't a concentration camp. We're not in Germany now. We're in the United States. You can't pull any of your tricks. As far as you're concerned, Miss Lane... This penthouse apartment might just as well be in Siberia. Except that you won't freeze to death. Because we're going to make it hot for you. Oh, that's very funny. But you won't think it's so funny when I... Then what? Never mind. You had best learn, Fräulein, that when I ask a question, I expect an answer. Take your hand off my arm. You were about to tell us something of interest. I changed my mind. Let go of my arm. You're hurting me. Why did you come here? Who sent you? Oh, go ahead. Break my arm. Demonstrate how powerful you are. How strong, how courageous. Speak up. It's your last chance. You'll crawl like the insect you are when the FBI men get here. You hear that? She's bluffing. Perhaps. But we cannot afford to gamble on it. No, don't gamble, Hella. As you said, someone is bound to lose. And this time it may be you. I would not count on it if I were you, Fräulein. Strauss. Ja, Hella. We will leave at once. It's the usual manner. 
It is possible there may be visitors after we are gone. Take the necessary precautions. That is all. Now, Miss Lynn, if you will be so kind as to accompany us to the terrace. I find it quite comfortable in here, thank you. Your comfort is not one of my primary considerations. If you please. The night air doesn't agree with me. That is indeed unfortunate. But under the circumstances of no importance, I am sure our mutual friends, the Yellow Mask, will be happy to escort you to the terrace. More than happy. And you'd better come quietly. Keep away from me. I'm warning you. Just take it easy. You let go of take me. Take it easy. Put your hand over her mouth. With her frantic cries for help muffled and unheard, Lois is forced out on the terraced roof of the apartment building. Meanwhile, Tony, the cab driver, having grown impatient, tried to gain access to the penthouse without success. Worried, he drove back to the Daily Planet and enlisted the help of Clark Kent. We join them in the taxi as it races to the apartment house. The last thing she said was, wait for me around the corner. I'll be down in an hour. When was this? Ten minutes after nine. Uh-huh. Well, I waited, but she didn't show. So then I tried to get up to the penthouse where she said she was gone. Nothing to it. I tell you, Mr. Kent, that apartment house is phony. Now, one of them guys can even talk good. They all got foreign accents. The guy that runs the elevator, the doorman, even the superintendent. What kind of a joint is it? I don't know, Tony, but we'll find out. I sure hope nothing happened to Miss Lane. Don't you worry about Lois. She can take care of herself. Oh, uh-huh. Why wouldn't they let you up to the penthouse, did they say? Yeah, they give me a cock and bull story about the place being empty. Nobody living there. Huh? I knew it was a lot of malarkey because if the joint was empty, why did Miss Lane come right down? That makes sense, don't it? Certainly does. Here we are, Mr. Kent. All right, now you stay in the cab, Tony. Okay. Keep the motor running. I'll go around the side of the building do a little investigating. You sure you don't want me along? Positive. I'll be back soon. Okay. Only one way to get up to that penthouse. As Superman. Now, I could wring Lois's neck for doing this. Not only is she endangered herself, but now it'll take twice as long to get anything on Heller and the mask. Hmm. The side street looks dark enough. Nobody in sight. Off for these clothes. And up. Up. There. This must be the terrace. I don't see any lights, but that door should lead somewhere. It's locked. I'll have to force it. Okay. That does it. Now to look around. It's funny. The place does seem empty. No furniture, no rugs. I wonder whether the lights work. I'll try that switch. Yeah, they work all right. The room's barren. Nothing but four walls. That's what they told Tony, that the penthouse was unoccupied. Still, it doesn't make sense. Where's Lois? Wait a minute. I hear a faint hissing sound. That's either steam or compressed air, but where's it coming from? Great Scott. What was that? There's no question about this apartment being unoccupied, Kent. Evidently, we had the wrong steer. Max Heller wasn't using this as his headquarters. That's what I thought, Major Campbell, the first time I saw these blank walls... You mean Heller did occupy these premises? There's no question about it. When did he move? He hasn't moved. Now, look here, Kent. There isn't a stick of furniture in the place. We've gone through all seven rooms. I know. Well, don't tell me Heller and his gang slept on the floors. No, not at all. This apartment is still beautifully furnished. Kent, are you out of your mind? Do you call this furnished? Why, there isn't even a picture on the walls. <laughs> now, look, Kent. We're at war. There's a lot of work to be done. We can't afford to waste time on practical jokes. I'm really surprised at you. You're going to be more surprised in a moment. Just follow me. Hey, where are you going? Into this closet. Yeah. Now what? Just step inside here a moment, will you? Yeah. All the way in, please. Oh, Kent, if this is some silly trick of yours... It's a trick, all right, but it isn't mine and it isn't silly. Keep your eye on that wall of the closet. Yeah. What are you fumbling for? What do you expect to find in here? A little push button. Ah, oh, here it is. Now, watch. A secret panel. Exactly. You see what's behind it? Oh, looks like a control board. And those are switches, aren't they? Yes, and each one is marked. Look. There's living room, dining room, foyer, kitchen. Each room has its own switch. What are they for, Kent? Major Campbell, you're about to see something that will not only amaze you, but prove to you that Max Heller is no ordinary espionage agent. The man is clever. And we've got to be just a little more clever to catch him with the goods. Oh, what is this thing you're going to show me? Don't step outside this closet now. You may get hurt. 
Just watch the room with its four blank walls and not a stick of furniture. I'm going to pull the switch marked living room. You ready? Yeah. All right. Good heavens, Kent. The walls are swinging around. The floor is turning upside down. Keep watching, Major. The entire room will turn inside out. In a moment, you'll see it completely furnished, from pictures on the walls to ashtrays on the tables. Kent, it's amazing. I scarcely believe my eyes. Yeah. Transformation is complete. You can step out of the closet now. Yes, but how do those chairs and couches stay where they are? Why don't the lamps fall over when the floor upends? Everything is bolted down. Tables, chairs, and couches are bolted to the floor. The lamps are bolted to the tables. Even the ashtrays can't be moved. Oh, I see. How on earth did you discover this, Kent? Well, fortunately, I can see through... See through what? Walls? Uh, <laughs> hardly, sir. Uh, what I meant was that I could uh, uh, see through tricks like this. Oh. I knew the apartment couldn't be empty, and yet it was, despite the fact that there hadn't been time to strip it of its furnishings. I still can't believe it, Kent. You said Hella was clever. <laughs> Brilliant is the word. Mm. If you hadn't stumbled on this ingenious device, Helen might have kept this hideout a secret from us forever. Oh, no. Uh, what about Miss Lane? Uh, her disappearance puzzles me. Your men have searched the building from top to bottom, haven't they? Not only that, but every employee from the Janet Arp has been grilled. I know absolutely nothing. Uh, that's to be expected. I'm certain they're all in Heller's employ. Where could Miss Lane be? Well, either with Heller or trailing him. From the looks of things, I'm afraid she's with him. That's why he skipped out in such a hurry. Lois probably tipped him off that we knew about this hideout. And then to find her, we've got to find Helen. That won't be so easy. Mm. I wish she hadn't interfered. So do I, but that's water over the dam. The damage is done. All we can do is try and correct it. Heller has the only existing set of blueprints showing how to construct a mechanical man. And he has Lois. Thus far, things have been going his way. That won't last long. Well, what do you propose doing? Well, first, we've got to know how Heller left the building certainly didn't go out the front entrance, not if he had Lois with him. Well, we've had men stationed front and back for a week, Kent. I told you we were watching the building. I have a complete report here in my pocket. Yeah, let me see. Ella entered the building through the front entrance five days ago, and he never left. And yet he's gone. Well, how? He may be clever, but he certainly can't fly. Wait a minute. Fly? Oh, don't be silly, Kent. After all, there's a limit No, to... no, no, wait. Huh? You remember my telling you I heard a strange hissing sound like escaping steam? Yes, but what's that got to do with it? When you mentioned flying, something struck me. Let's have a look at the terrace. We may find something interesting. All right, I don't know what you expect to find out here. There's no telling. I'd better lead the way. It's pretty dark. Yeah, here, wait a minute. I'll get a pocket flash. Oh, good. Let me have it, will you? Yeah. Thanks. There, that's better. Well, look at the size of this terrace. Big enough to park a small plane, isn't it? Can't. Is that what you're thinking, that Hella had a plane up here? Possible, isn't it? Well, hardly. There isn't even enough room for a takeoff and landing of an auto gyro, much less a regular airplane. Hold up a minute. What are those steel cylinders stacked up there? Oh, well, that's strange. And yeah, let's look at them. Yeah. Compressed air cylinders. That's what made that hissing sound. Yeah, but what are they used for? I don't know, but we're going to find out. Wait, Scott. What is it, Ken? Look, where I'm shining the light. Huh? There's an opening in the brick wall. Come on. Okay, now be careful, Ken. Neither of us is armed. There's nothing in here but some mechanism. Look at it, Major. What do you think it is? I don't know, Ken. I've never seen anything like it before. What's your guess? It isn't a guess. That's an airplane catapult operated by compressed air. Heller did get away in a plane. Oh, yeah, no, not so fast, Ken. You mustn't jump at conclusions. What makes you think this mechanism is a plane catapult? Well, I've seen catapults on naval airplane carriers. This one is similar. Well, maybe you're right, but... Oh, now, wait a minute. It's impossible. How could they ever get a plane into this opening in the wall? It's deep enough, but it can't be more than ten feet wide. A plane needs wings to fly, you know. Well, maybe the wings on this plane fold back against the fuselage. When it's catapulted, it shoots up like a rocket. The wings unfold and it flies. Can't you're letting your imagination run away with you? Well, it's like something out of a book. Well, anything's possible in this day and age. You never would have believed a complete room could be turned inside out. No, but... The more I think about this, the more I'm convinced we have the answer. But can't a plane with folding wings that could be shot into the air like a rocket would be invaluable? Well, if Heller's using one, it can't be any secret to his government. Probably isn't. Well, then why haven't they made use of them in the war? Maybe they are. You remember the sudden Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor? Hundreds of planes came over. Too many to be launched from a carrier... Well, it might very well have been that most of those planes were catapulted from the decks of destroyers with mechanisms like this. Mm. Shot into the air like rockets, one after the other. Mm. You really think so? It's possible. As I said, almost anything is. 
All the more reason for getting our hands on Max Heller quickly. I'll put every man in the department on his trail. Yeah, we'll never catch him that way. And if we did, what good would it do us? He's a naturalized American citizen, isn't he? Yes. But if we can ever prove he's a foreign agent, he'll lose that citizenship fast enough. Yeah, that's just the point. We can't afford to bring him in until we have an airtight case against him. Of course, if he's abducted Lois, that's enough to put him behind bars for a good long stretch. Oh, I'd forgotten about Miss Lane and all this excitement. You're convinced Hella has taken her with him? Oh, no question about it. She'll make a perfect hostage in case he gets into a jam. But isn't he liable to do her some harm? No, no. Heller's too smart for that. Lois is worth more to him alive. That's why I'm not too worried, at least for the present. Only one thing that bothers me. How are we going to locate Heller? Well, there's only one way. Put 2,000 trained men on this trail. Uh, I'd like to avoid that if we can. Let him think he's fooled us. Then he won't be on his guard. Sooner or later, he'll come back here. Or one of his henchmen will. Yes, I know, Kent, but... He has the blueprints for that mechanical man. He, he'll start building those steel monsters and creating panic. You know what happened when that first one got loose? It, it terrified people. No, don't worry about that. After all, he's in America. You can't find facilities for building ten-foot steel giants on every corner. That takes time, and it must be done undercover. Well, after what I've seen tonight, I'm almost ready to believe it can create miracles. But I'm willing to go along with you if whatever you suggest doesn't endanger the lives of innocent people. All we need is one more mechanical man scared to throw this country into panic, and that's what men like Heller are trying to do. Get under our skin, frighten us, break down morale. Did it in Norway, in Denmark, and France. We can't let them do it here. They won't. Americans don't frighten that easily. I hope you're right. Well, what's the next step? We'll leave everything as we found it. Let's get back and turn that room into four bare walls again. Come on. It seems to me we're taking a long chance. Wait a minute. Huh? What's the matter? Someone's in the apartment. I heard a door open. Uh, it may be one of my men. Let's make sure first. Listen. Oh, hey, that's not one of my men. No, it's one of Heller's. Don't go. Hey, Kent, they're coming out here. We're trapped. Fine. We're going to let them capture us. Are you mad? It's the only way to discover where Heller's hiding out. They'll take us to him. Now, don't resist. But they must have guns. They'll shoot to kill. No, they won't. We're going to give ourselves up, Major Campbell. Don't resist them. Kent, you're out of your mind. No, I'm not. We can't possibly locate Heller's new hideout unless they take us there as prisoners. It's the only way. Now, trust me. But you don't know these men. They're killers. They won't hesitate. Be quiet. Wait a minute. Here they come. I'll handle it. We're right here. Get down, Major. You see, Ken, I told you. Just keep low and start crawling back. They can't see us in the dark. Once we get around that bend behind the brick wall, we're all right. Come on. We're having a chance now. They know we're here. We're dead men, Ken. All right, slip behind the wall. <laughs> No, what? Right. Just a matter of time. No way of getting off this terrace except through those French doors. I didn't think they'd shoot. That's because you don't know them. Listen to the filthy beggars. What are they saying? They couldn't catch it all, but the first one said not to waste bullets until they saw us. Oh, I think I'll give them that opportunity. They crave fight, they'll get it. You stay here. Now, Kent, where are you going? They take their toy pistols away. Hey, Kent, you're mad at suicide. Don't worry, Major. I can handle them. Kent, come back. Hey, Kent! might be suicide for anyone else, but it's just a little workout for Superman. All right, my quick-triggered friends, here's your chance to get a little free target practice. Go. I'll shine Campbell's flashlight in my face just to make it easy for them. Here goes. Ah, not bad at all. Two of those bounced off my chest. <laughs> Poor Campbell, he's dying a thousand deaths. Probably thinks I'm riddled by this time. So do those heinies. Here they come. Now for the finishing touch. Well, you boys aren't bad with guns. Now let's use this. Try this for size. Ah, that was a perfect fit. Now, how about you? Swinging that gun won't help you, but this might. Yeah, it did. Helped you right into dreamland. Next time you won't play so rough. Ken, where are you answer me? Right. Oh, almost made a mistake then. Use my real voice. This has to be Kent talking. <clears throat> I'm right here, Major Campbell. Everything's okay. You can come out from behind that wall. Ken, you're alive. How did you survive those bullet hearts? I can't believe it. Well, there's the proof. Two ice-cold foreign agents. Ugly devils, aren't they? But, but Ken, how did you do it? I, I heard three shots. Neither of them could hit the side of a barn. Shall we drag them inside? So since they're not going to walk for a while, you take the little one. I'll handle this big one. Right. You don't know the meaning of fear, Kent. Not another man alive would have done what you did. It's beyond all belief. Washington will hear about this. I'd much rather they wouldn't. Here, dump these specimens in the corner. Yeah, it's fine. Huh. I expected the entire police department to be up here by this time. Well, those shots may have sounded like backfiring down on the street. Wait a minute. What's that? 
Sounds like Morse code. Yeah. It's coming from behind those bookshelves. Hear it? Yes. One of these shelves must open or slide back. Ah, oh, this one probably. The books on it are dummies. Now, wait a minute. Let's see here. You think there's a radio behind it? I'm sure of it. Uh, here, I got it. It swings around on a pivot. Uh, it's a radio, all right. Yes, sir. Short wave sending and receiving said voice and key. Hey, wait a minute. That isn't Morse code. No. It's code of some kind. Listen. Nothing I ever heard before. No. Let's get some of it down on paper. Maybe we can decipher it later. Do you have a pencil? Yes, yes. All right. Let's get as much as we can. It may give us a clue. As Kent and Major Campbell attempt to record the dots and dashes of the unknown wireless code coming from the hidden shortwave receiver, a strange scene is being enacted in the basement room of an abandoned factory 200 miles from the city of Metropolis. There, Max Heller is bent over a portable shortwave wireless transmitter, sending the coded message Kent and Campbell are attempting to receive. Standing beside him is his new partner in espionage, the Yellow Mask. Uh, it's no use. Strauss isn't there. I told him I would get to him promptly at midnight. Something must have happened. He may have forgotten. My men never forget. It amounts to suicide. Now something has gone wrong. Strauss would be there. How could anything have gone wrong? Everyone in this apartment house works for you from the janitor up. I know. But there's always a chance. I don't like it. It may mean finding another location in the city. That will be difficult. You know who's to blame if anything has gone wrong, Heller? Who? That lame girl. Oh, bring her in. Perhaps she has changed her mind about talking. I doubt it. No, Strauss could not have forgotten. He's too reliable. Something has happened. I know it. Let go of my arm. Come on. Come on. Here she is, close the door. Now, what do you want? I thought I made it clear to you, Helen, that all the questioning in the world won't do you a bit of good. There will be no more questioning, Miss Lane. I think shortly you will be willing to tell me how you knew of my headquarters in the city. Well, think again. Once is enough. Have you ever seen a mechanical man, Miss Lane? She's seen one, all right. She wrote that story in the Daily Planet when Thornton's model got loose. She was an eyewitness. Is that true? Isn't everything the yellow mask says true? This is no time for humor. Evidently, you fail to realize we are not playing a game. Whether or not I learn how you discovered my whereabouts is relatively unimportant. It's just that I am curious. And frequently, I will go to any extremes to satisfy my curiosity. You understand? I find this very boring. I should endeavor to make it more interesting for you, Miss Lane. But first, I must explain a few things. You know, of course, what my mission is in this country. I know what your end will be. Prison for life. And that'll be too good. I appreciate your concern. But to go on. I am here, Miss Lane, to create panic through fear and destruction. We are fighting a war, your country and mine. I have pledged myself to help win that war with all means at my disposal. Why don't you get a few poison snakes? They'd be good company for you and this, uh, reptile. Let me handle the hell or I'll make a talk. One moment. I will do all the handling for the present. Now, as I was saying, Miss Lane, my mission must be performed at any cost. You may not know it, but I have secured the plans and blueprints showing the construction of the mechanical men with which you are familiar. They have been in my possession scarcely 24 hours, and yet we have made amazing progress. Very interesting. You will learn how interesting in a few moments. I am going to show you the first of the steel men we have created in this seemingly deserted factory. I'm going to let you decide how he shall be used. Oh, I wouldn't want to rob you of the pleasure. After all, destruction is your business. There will be other mechanical men, as many as my mechanics can build. But this one, the first, will be dedicated to you. He is waiting for you, all bright and shining in the large room across the corridor. Shall we look him over? I'll decline that privilege if you don't mind. Ah, but I do mind. You must join us, Miss Lane. I said you must join us. All right. If it satisfies your twisted sense of humor. Just across the corridor. The mask will open the door for you. Behold, the mechanical man, Miss Lane. The steel monster that will drive strong men to seek shelter. The ten-foot giant that will carry death and destruction in his massive hands. Behold him. You're nothing but an animal, Heller. We will save the compliments for some other time. Now watch while I press a button on this control. Watch how he walks. So? Enough of that. There is something else. I have gone further than your American inventor. I have given the mechanical man the power of speech. Now he can talk. 
I press this button. Listen. I am the mechanical man. Nothing can stop me. Run for your lives. Run. I am the Why do you shrink back, Miss Lane? Man. It doesn't frighten you, does it? Let me out of here. Just a moment. This is your mechanical man, if you remember. He is ready to be sent out on his first assignment. I was thinking perhaps that it would be wise to send him to one of the shipyards close by. You see, the carrier on his chest is loaded with incendiary bombs. They will explode when he reaches the yard. There is much wood in a shipyard. It will burn easily. And so are the men working there. You're both raving maniacs. You're not human. You can't be. Even dogs have more sense of decency. You wish to save the shipyard from destruction, Miss Lane? You would like to spare the lives of the men who might be trapped in the fire? Well, it is very simple. Tell us who else besides yourself knew of my whereabouts in the city. Tell us how and why you paid me a visit masquerading as a foreign agent. You think I'm a fool, Heller? On the contrary. I regard you as a very sensible young woman. You have it within your power to prevent the catastrophe. The answer is no. Roll back the side doors, please. With pleasure. Have you changed your mind, Miss Lane? The answer is still no. Very well. Then we shall send our monster on his way. I am the mechanical man for your lives. Run. Stunned, Lois shrinks back as a towering steel giant sweeps by her, its grotesque arms swinging like those of a mammoth gorilla. Suddenly, as it nears the open doors, Lois cries out to Max Heller. Stop it! I'll tell you anything you want to know. Stop it! I'm trying. There's something wrong with the control pen. That's not the truth. You're lying to me. Stop it! Fool that you are. Do you not see I'm doing everything possible? You've got to stop it! You've got to! What's wrong, Helen? What's she screaming about? Listen to me, Mask. Find Hirschman, my head mechanic. Something is wrong with this panel. Hurry! The mechanical man is out of control. Now where is Hirschman? Tom Kopf, in the machine shop. Well, what are you waiting for? I don't get excited, Helen. I'm going. Nothing can stop me. Run for your lives. With nothing Run. guiding its movement save an uncontrollable radio impulse, the, the mechanical man, man, more horrible than ever now the that it possesses a voice, leaves the factory behind Run. and lumbers in the direction of the shipyard five miles away. Run. The metallic plodding of its weighted feet I'm shaking the very the earth. Man. Once again, the news spreads like the wildfire. Women and children shudder behind drawn Run. blinds, finding life. no comfort in locked and bolted doors. Run. Suddenly, as though an unseen hand had reached I down and wiped the them clean, man. the streets are deserted. Nothing and still, the mechanical me. man plods on, Run sounding a fearsome life. warning. Run. I'm the mechanical man. Nothing can stop me. Run for your life. Run. Meanwhile, miles away in the busy office of the shipyard superintendent, the first terrifying news of the mechanical man's approach comes from a panic-stricken yard patrolman. I see him near Sutherland, Mr. Kennedy. He's heading this way. The mechanical man. The mechanical man? Where did you get such fantastic information? Oh, Brian heard it on his car radio. Well, we'll soon check up on that. Wait a minute. Get me Captain Stanley at the police station. That's right. So call me back. There ain't much time, Mr. Kennedy. They say he's only a mile from the yard. Who said that? O'Brien. That's what he heard. Well, I'll have a talk with O'Brien. We're doing important work around here, 24 hours a day. I can't be disturbed by stupid rumors that create panic. Yeah. Captain Stanley? Kennedy at the shipyard. Yeah. And one of our men here claims he heard a radio report to the effect... What? You say it's true? And it's headed for the yard? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Yeah, at once. Ring the alarm bell, Joe. we got to clear this yard of every man in it. Come on, now, hurry. There isn't much time. As 5,000 shipbuilders drop their tools and pour out of the yard in a frightened milling mass, Clark Kent, unaware of the impending disaster, arrives at the home of Wallace Thornton, original inventor of the mechanical man, to enlist his aid in the search for Max Heller. Kent. Oh, I'm glad to see you. Come in. Thank you. This is what you call locking the barn door after the horse is stolen. I've been mighty careful since those original blueprints were taken. I don't suppose they've been recovered. Not yet, but we're on Heller's trail. That's why I dropped in to ask you a few questions. I hope I can answer them. What are they? Well, I'd better start from the beginning. As you know, the espionage division of the Secret Service knew about Max Heller's headquarters in the Metropolis apartment building. We suspected, too, that our friend the Yellow Mask was with Heller. And we were waiting to get both of them with the goods before closing in. Well, unfortunately, a young newspaper woman kicked over the apple cart. Heller and the Mask fled, taking the young woman, Miss Lane, with them. Wasn't the building being watched? Oh, yes, yes, day and night. They escaped from the terrace in a plane. You're not serious, Ken. Absolutely. 
It was evidently a plane operated by a catapult, a mechanism that shot it off the roof like a rocket. And from all the evidence, it was equipped with folding wings. Now, is that possible, Mr. Thornton? Anything is possible, Kent. Uh, what makes you think the plane had folding wings? Well, the catapulting mechanism was in a recess in the wall. A space about, oh, 50 feet deep and only 10 feet wide. Hmm. <laughs> Unless the plane's wings folded flat against the fuselage, it never could have gotten in there. Now, let me show you something interesting, Kent. I think I have it in this cabinet. Yes, here it is. Oh, that's a balsa wood model of a plane, isn't it? Yes. A plane with folding wings. See how they snap back? Oh. This model operates on the same principle you mentioned, a catapult. Wow. In this case, we use a strong elastic band. I see. Now watch. I'll send it up. Notice how the wings lay back against the fuselage to cut down wind resistance as it gains altitude. Uh -huh. Now keep your eye on it. Here it goes. Oh, it shoots up like an arrow. Watch the wings unfold when it reaches its peak. There they go. Why, that's amazing. Oh, if it had a motor, it could keep flying. Exactly. I developed this model three months ago. But evidently, from what you tell me, someone went into production on the actual ship. But uh, go on with your story. What about Hella and the yellow mask? Oh, well, they had skipped, as I said. But in their empty apartment, we discovered a shortwave wireless set hidden behind a bookcase. A message in code was coming over. We recorded as much of it as we could, and it's being deciphered now. It may yield a clue to Hella's whereabouts. Frankly, Kent, I'm worried. With the mechanical man blueprints in Hella's hands, anything can happen. Yeah. I've been working day and night to perfect a radio control mechanism capable of stopping any mechanical man Hella builds and releases just in case we never recover those blueprints. Right. But it's quite a job because there's no telling what wavelength he might use. But it has to be done. We've got to stop him somehow. Yeah, it's quite true. But it'll be a long time before Heller makes use of those blueprints. Steel isn't so easy to get these days, and, well, where can he build a ten-foot giant in absolute secrecy? I wish I felt the way you do, but somehow I have a premonition that something ghastly is going to happen. You recall the panic caused by my model running wild? Just think what would happen if Heller and his men released dozens of these steel monsters. Well, even one could do irreparable damage, not to mention the panic and terror. Imagine, Kent, a mechanical man loosing a shipyard... Almost as though his mind was spanning the 200-mile gap separating the doomed shipyard and his laboratory, Wallace Thornton is picturing for Kent exactly what is happening. Even as he speaks, Max Heller's mechanical I'm monster is bearing down on the yard like a creature out of another world, carrying in the steel pocket of his massive chest enough incendiary material to level everything in sight. Before him loom the half-completed hulls of a dozen destroyers cradled in wooden scaffolding, dry tinder for the unquenchable fire of his bombs. All appearances, the yard is empty, deserted, swept clean of its horde of defense workers. But hidden behind sandbag barriers, their muscles tense, are six gray-clad members of the state police, expert marksmen armed with machine guns. Crouch low, they wait until the steel giant reaches the gate, and then... Spitting flame, the guns hurl a barrage of screaming steel at the huge monster. For a split second, the powerful impact of the bullet seems to stop him in his tracks. Both blood-red eyes shatter into a million fragments, and the ghostly voice rising from the depths of the metal body fades off into an eerie death rattle. And then, shuddering, it continues on, crashing through the locked iron gate as though it were paper. One by one, the machine guns, their bullet clips empty, stop firing. And there is no sound but the dread plodding of the monster's heavy feet. Meanwhile, back at Wallace Thornton's laboratory, Clark Kent is about to leave. I'll call you if anything turns up, Mr. Thornton. I want to get back now and see whether Major Campbell's men have deciphered that code message. Uh, keep in touch with me, Kent. I'll let you know if I make any progress on the control device. Oh, yes. I'll be anxious to hear about that. Oh, it's only five o'clock? Oh, it must be later than that. Oh, my watch stops. Oh, wait a moment. I'll turn on the radio. There might be a time signal. All right, thanks. It takes a second or two to heat up. Sometime in a week, a giant mechanical monster has run amok and threatens to destroy the Bartlett shipyard, one of the largest on the coast. What's that? Less than two minutes ago, the steel Frankenstein was reported crashing through the yard gate despite the best efforts of state police marksmen to stop it with machine guns. The Bartlett yard, located at Haines River, has 12 destroyers ready to launch and a dozen more partially built. The police seem powerless... I've got to go, Mr. Thornton. Kent, come back. This is serious. I know it is. I'll call you. Kent, wait a minute. Don't go. Bartlett Shipyard, eh? Haines River. I'm just stuck around the side of this building. There's still enough daylight to make it risky, but I've got to take the chance. As Superman. Up! Up! I 
and away! Clears the thick billowing smoke above the roaring blaze, and Superman, red cloak streaming, drops from the sky like a plummet and lands at the water's edge, into the very heart of the blinding inferno. Ah, I had a feeling I'd be too late. This isn't any ordinary fire. That stuff spreads fast. There's only one thing to do. Launch those destroyers. If I can get them out into the water, I may save them. Here goes. Ah. Shielded from sight by an impenetrable wall of flame, Superman, single-handed, sends the completed ships down the waves one after the other. Taxing even his superhuman strength, the 10,000-ton ocean dreadnoughts, locked in steel and wood scaffolding, yield reluctantly to his straining muscles, quiver from stem to stern as he forces them into the heaving water. Ah. Only two more to go and those ships will be safe. Come on, don't fight me. We need you to slap the jets off the map. a girl, there you go. All right, now for the last. You're going to follow your sister ship. That's it. Start moving. Just a little more. That does it. Oh, boy, uh... ah, that fire's spreading fast. It'll reach those other boats if I don't do something about it. Water won't put it out. It's tearing up the earth will. I'll smother it. And after that's done, I've got to find that mechanical man. I won't destroy this one. I'll use him. Like a human steam shovel, Superman tears into the hard, frozen ground, fashioning a miniature earthquake that smothers the leaping flames under tons of sand and gravel. And then, gradually, the fire subsides until, in the gathering darkness, there are only glowing embers and curling wisps of gray smoke. And as the smoke clears, all that can be seen are the twelve destroyers floating free and untouched. Both Superman and the mechanical monster have vanished as though into thin air. But at the abandoned factory five miles from the shipyard, where Max Heller and his men have set up machinery to build an army of steel robots, Lois Lane, a prisoner of the espionage ring, faces its mastermind, her eyes flashing, white-hot anger draining the color from her cheeks. You call yourself a man, Heller. It's a joke, a ghastly, horrible joke. God never created anything slimier than you are, never. Are you through? Yes, I'm through. You might just as well get rid of me now. No matter what happens, I'll never tell you who's on your trail. They'll catch up with you yet, and when they do, my only hope is that they make you suffer unbelievable torture. Is that all, Fraulein? Yes. That's all. Now, I will have something to say. You think I did not live up to my promise, the promise I made you, that if you gave me the information I wished, I would not dispatch the mechanical man to destroy the shipyard. That is what you think, Nine. You know exactly what I think. Yes, and you are wrong. Something happened to the radio control panel. The mechanical man could not be stopped. It was unavoidable, unfortunate. Unfortunate? That's a fine word for wholesale destruction. Unfortunate. My mechanic is working on the control panel now. You can see that with your own eyes. It's too late now. That flaming sky told the story. You've done your little job. I see there's no point in discussing the matter with you further. The mask will escort you back to your room where you will remain for the present. Oh, why prolong the show, Hella? I'd rather be dead than breathe the same air that you breathe. Take away. Come on. Let go of my arm. Come on, or I'll I break. told you she is not to be hurt. It'd do her good. She'd sing a different tune. You have my orders? I have a good reason. Show her to our room. All right. Have it your own way. Well, Hirschman, is it not yet repaired? What kind of a mechanic are you? The wires were crossed. Now it will work. Let us see. We will make an attempt to bring back our steel messenger who did such a fine job. Our witch dial controls the flying mechanism, uh, the propeller. This one here, Heller. So, now to effect its return... This switch. So, that is all? Yeah. Unless it was destroyed in the fire, it should not take long. You, uh, you saw the flames from the sky, Hirschman. Yeah, I saw them. Uh, it is only the beginning, Hirschman. Only the beginning. You will build these amazing mechanical men, and I will make good use of them. The sky will be on fire all over this country. Uh, it does not take long to bring frightened people to the knees. What is that idea? A plane motor. No. It is the mechanical man. Roll back the doors, Hirschman, quickly. Look, Hirschman. It is flying in. Look. I cannot believe my eyes. But it is true. We have brought it back, Hirschman. We have twisted the dial and, and turned the switch, and here it is. Uh, close the doors. The red bulbs in the eyes are gone, and the steel is black with smoke, but that is a small matter. Tomorrow you'll repair it. Hirschman, all of the world is in the palm of that creature's hand, and we are his master, and the master of all that will follow him. But come, it is late. This miracle we will explore in the morning. Now, Hirschman, we cannot lose. 
Hide it. Hide it. Cloaked in the all-enveloping darkness of the high-ceiling basement room, the mechanical man, its eyes hollow, gaping sockets, and its steel body smoke-blackened, stands like some prehistoric giant suddenly robbed of motion. Not a sound disturbs the silence of the underground chamber. Not a pinpoint of light shows through the pitch black. And suddenly a faint metallic scraping cuts the stillness like a sharp knife. And slowly, one of the steel plates that form the mechanical monster's back raises up on its hinges. For a moment, there is silence again. And then, the red-caped figure of Superman, hidden in the vast cavern of the mechanical man's hollow body, emerges from the opening and drops lightly to the stone floor. So far, so good. I knew there was only one way of locating Heller, and that was to let the mechanical man bring me back here. Good thing I didn't disturb any of those wires inside him or he wouldn't have worked. Now to find Lois and those blueprints. After that, Heller and the mask will be taken care of, and well, this door should lead someplace. Moving silently along the dim-lit corridor, Superman calls into play his amazing power of X-ray vision. Piercing the stone walls of the rooms on the corridor, he picks out the one occupied by Lois, notices that she is stretched out on a cot seemingly asleep. Drawing up before the door, he reaches under his cape and in a few moments is once again dressed in the disguising street clothes of Clark Kent. Softly, he taps on the door. Lois! Lois! Who is it? Clark Kent, open up. I can't. The door's locked from the outside. Maybe I can force it. Stand back. <laughs> Quick, let's close it again. Someone's liable to come by. Clark, how in heaven thing? Save all that for later, Lois. It's a long story. Where's Max Heller? In a room at the end of the corridor. Can't you at least tell me how you knew I was here? Not now. Have you any idea where the mechanical man blueprints are? No, I don't. But they've already built one of those horrible creatures that set fire to a shipyard tonight. Yes, I know. Chances are that Heller keeps the blueprints with him in his room. But he keeps a revolver there, too. That's all right. Don't be a fool, Clark. He's a cold-blooded killer. He Shh, quiet. Someone's coming. Quick, stretch out on the cot. Okay, Clark. Now, don't move. No matter what happens. Who forced this door? I did, Heller. Oh, too bad you missed, but I won't. Clark, are you hurt? No, but our friend Heller is. Get back. We have another visitor. Probably with the yellow mask. I won't give him a chance to ask any questions. Kemp, what are you doing? It's the mask, all right. Uh-oh. That shot must have gotten them all up. You've got Heller's gun, Lois. Watch these two specimens. I'll take care of the rest. All right, boys, come after that. Come into this office, Mr. Thornton. It's too noisy out here. Yeah, that's better. Well, I was sorry to have to drag you down to the Daily Planet to give you these blueprints, but I've been so busy tying up loose ends I couldn't get away. I don't mind in the least, Mr. Kent. Frankly, I'm the most amazed man in the world. How you ever rounded up that espionage gang and recovered these plans will always be a mystery to me. Well, I was lucky, that's all. Well, it was more than luck, Kent. I... I'm sure you don't appreciate what you've done for your country. It's beyond description. I feel much safer now that Heller is behind bars. <laughs> he isn't. What do you mean? Major Campbell called me an hour ago. Heller died of a heart attack while being transported from police headquarters to the city jail. Well, I don't like to say it, but that's even better. The man was ruthless and clever. Probably the most dangerous individual in the country. His death is no loss to any of us. No, it's... A... Oh, excuse me. Can't speaking. Mr. Kent? Yes? I called to compliment you on your achievement. It was very remarkable. But perhaps next time the tables will be turned. Who is this? Max Heller. Stunned, Clark Kent stares into the telephone mouthpiece. Can he believe his ears? Has he been listening to a voice from the dead? Or is it some trick? Don't fail to hear the next episode for a startling development in this story of foreign espionage. Tune in and listen, we're the Superman! Don't forget, tune in again for the next thrilling episode with Superman. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature 